Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Thank you for coming. Um, before I begin today, in the interest of full disclosure, um, I, I am a lawyer. I have, uh, and, uh, I have practiced in the area of, as a pro bono lawyer, uh, in children's rights with regards to disabilities and special education for about 23 years. Um, in addition, I'm a customer. Uh, 11 years ago, I ha was fortunate enough to give birth to a child who uh, has autism and um, is a delightful young man who has benefited greatly from the services of many of the folks in this room and the Yale Child Study Center. So I appreciate that, and there made me a mix of law and life because I've, I've had to do it from both sides. Um, it's a lot easier to represent someone else's child, I can surely tell you that. Okay. So today we're going to talk a little bit about the legal rights of children with autism and related disorders. In reality, until very recently, that's all been sort of folded into the legal rights of children with disabilities. Was, um, autism didn't get a lot of special attention until fairly recently. And um, so much of the law that applies to children with special education needs, it's, it's very broad, but it applies to children with autism. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but because of my perspective on it, I wanted to start with the chronological look from the parent, um, the eyes of the parent who's told their child has, has autism, because that's kind of a stunning revelation, and for many, their first thought about law. Um, you know, you come in and your child is diagnosed, and that has its obvious ramifications in terms of how you feel socially and personally, emotionally. Um, there's the clinical response. I've got to go to doctors. I've got to become involved with all sorts of specialists. I don't even know what OT means, and now I need one. And then there's also the emotional response of, will I go to the wedding? Will there be soccer? And crazy kinds of things run through your mind. So, um, you know, that ran through my mind, even though I was a disability lawyer. The first thought was not at all about what I was going to do legally for my child. The real scary part is when you walk out the door of any doctor's office, any facility, after being told that your child has autism, because there's no plan. You kind of are used in life to walking out with the list, and here's, you do this, if you do this, then this will happen, and then this, and logical progression. And, you know, at least in my experience, that's not what happens. You get a diagnosis, you might get some websites, you get some referrals takes a long time sometimes to get appointments with the next set of individuals. And so you are really left with this interval where you end up with lots of information. You begin to worry, do you know I need to go to law school? Because right away people will tell you horror stories about special education and um, quackery and cures and you begin to really worry about legal rights. First thing you think is I cannot die. So you worry about, you know, a, a, a setting up a trust, a special needs trust for your child. So all kinds of legal things that you weren't thinking about with this darling little, you know, two-year-old two suddenly jump to the forefront. Um, you want to figure out how do you navigate the rest of your life. And this really becomes a legal issue, uh, not just one that is in terms of the child, but you're the manager of your child's case, essentially, as a parent. And I think that's important to know. As a disability lawyer, I was as dumbfounded as anyone who's ever gotten an autism diagnosis and was completely incapable for a very long time of uh, really addressing that in an unemotional way. Um, what you really have to worry about is people talk about best interest of the child always in the law, but what you're really thinking about now is it's not the best interest of the child, it's this child. And what is legally possible to do and ethically possible and educationally and socially possible, lots of things run through your mind. So parents are confused. What is a family to do? You have um, this lovely, odd little creature who um, you adore and you know you need to take care of for the rest of your life. And how are you going to set things up so that other people want to care for your child, will meet their social and legal obligations, and he or she will be educated in the best possible fashion. So that's sort of the background that most parents walk into the legal windmill, not just the medical one. 
Um, that's when the real struggles begin, is to get a little bit of knowledge and then it becomes quite overwhelming. Um, there's this new language and uh, the, the acronym world, uh, I had thought I'd known it all, but not yet. Um, new uh, jargon, um, latest studies, all sorts of things. I'm going to talk a little bit about jargon today and some of the great famous acronyms, that, uh, acronyms rather, maybe acronyms, that people need to know um, when they begin to deal with a child with autism would not have been in the normal person's lexicon prior to that. Um, you know, the only one who might not be talking to you is the child, his or him or herself. And, and that's the devastating part, really. You're being spoken to and at and around and as if you're not there about legal issues and what are you going to do. And you've got, in many instances, this little silent um, person really the focus of all of this. So you're very concerned about protecting that person's rights. Um, parents find themselves thrust into an educational system that is sooner than they planned and they may have just been planning on the school bus and crayons and off we go to regular old school and now it's thoughts of the dreaded short bus and how do I get that and when does it begin and how do I get my child into this system really not a well-formulated process for that to occur. So that's a great concern to parents. Um, we get too much advice. We get bad advice. We get some good advice. But we get plenty of advice, not all of it from the sources we would like and not at the times we want, some of it from charlatans, some of it from people who would prefer to just have us beat this demon out of our child, um, some in grocery stores and some via email uh, solicitations. We also get too little advice. You know, what you really want to know is what are the top five things I need to do right now to formulate this, where's my quarterback, call in the play, and I will do this. So it's this odd dilemma we find ourselves in. We know there's law out there. How do you tap into it? How do you begin to initiate this? And in a way that's hopefully going to be the appropriate balance for your child because you're in a negotiation. This is maybe the first mediation parents have ever had to engage in and it's very, very high stakes. As you know with autism, the earlier you start getting an appropriate program in place, the better and that pressure is coming at a time when you may or may not be among the most devastated and debilitated and sleepy that you've ever been. So legal distinctions become all of a sudden very important. Labels become important. Parents may resist the idea of a child getting an autism label. Um, in my mind, that label becomes a very important box to check later on, and I want the label. Um, had to be talked into the label myself, as I recall, but um, it's an important box to check in terms of getting services. So there's these emotional hurdles. I don't want to label my child. And, and yet we realize it becomes necessary. The thing I think is interesting about autism to me is it's the, sort of the intersection of medicine and law. Because you have a disease, and I saw it, of course, I, I sometimes call it, you know, educating the plague. We've got this thing that just it seems to be expanding. It's everywhere. We all know people with this. But it doesn't get cured. You don't go in and get surgery or a pill. If you see improvement, it's this arduous process and you've got to be very much engaged in it and it has to be treated at every stage of your life. You realize that you're going to have to invoke the law and precedent and some types of maybe legal services or legal knowledge to be able to help cure or treat your child. Um, you know, some of the things that deal with autism obviously you know can be handled medically those tend to be more sort of side effects and kind of peripheral things that don't go necessarily to the heart of autism and the behavior. Um, and so that intervention happens in a weird place. The schools become your hospital. And very often, certainly in the olden days of, you know, 10 years ago, um, the hospital wasn't ready to receive this patient. In many places, they still are not. And so a parent may have the role of becoming educator of legal obligations and educational obligations to people who either don't know or don't want to know or seem to have forgotten what the law is regarding special education, 
for children on the spectrum. In my personal opinion, this is somewhat heresy to say as an attorney, but um, if, there, if you're ever going to have autism, there's never been a better time in the history of the United States to have it. I don't want it, uh, would prefer it didn't exist, but we are light years ahead of where we would have been a number of years ago. Certainly, in my own case, my child would um, be feral and nonverbal had we not had laws that helped us get appropriate intervention and medical treatment at appropriate stages. So while um, I'm the first one to complain, I will say that the laws have actually have helped. Um, they've brought us forward leaps and bounds. What do we need advocates? You know, every parent, every person who deals with children with autism, it's my expectation that they should be engaged in some form of appropriate advocacy and that requires you know, some, some effort um, and some education. So it's not over, but I will say it's better than it used to be, and I think it's getting more enlightened. The world is getting more enlightened every day in the United States. Um, I can talk a little bit later about um, what might be happening globally to some extent. Um, I'm not gonna go through this exhaustively, but this, we didn't get to where we are today on the backs of nothing. A whole lot of things happened. To me, the most important thing that happened was something that seems unrelated, unrelated at all is Brown versus Board of Education. We all know that as, you know, bless Thorogood Marshall for coming up with the, uh, the case and arguing it successfully to the Supreme Court. Um, and it was a civil rights case involving racial segregation in schools. But what Brown did was stick the toe in the door of saying, Oh yeah, wait, separate but equal, disparate treatment, you know, children need an education, and people began to then think, oh yeah, what about disabled children? Um, what about gender? What about issues of age and fairness? And so Brown, to me, is truly, in the United States, the springboard to um, a whole array of later uh, acts of, uh, of Congress and litigation, and it kind of opened the doors. I'm going to go through this very quickly, but just to show you, sort of pile on what happened, we then move into an elementary and secondary school education act, um, then the education of the handicapped act, and you can see some of the archaic terminology. We are still dealing with terms in some of this law, these laws and the uh, legislative histories about feeble-mindedness and. Um, you know, some of this occurred in the era of the theory of the refrigerator mom for autism. And to some extent that's even still out there in some corners and it's astounding. Who's going to enact legislation to help a child with autism when the mother caused it? You know, maybe she should be prosecuted, but um, maybe she should cure, cure this too. So a whole host of laws and cases came up setting precedents such as that um, the state or the city or the school board has an obligation to help pay for the education of children with special needs or that they should be brought into the public school system. They can't be denied a public education. Um, important things like Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which I'll go into later, um, help to establish very basic rights. Um, we have the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, again, we're referring specifically to children and having a handicap. Um, autism at this time was still in a state of sort of early acceptance and it was, you know, uh, even to this day, um, people have said, aren't you fortunate? Your child is art artistic. And so you have to try to really work to educate people. Um, Congress needed it too, but you know, it, everyone needed it. and so. Um, appropriate uh, lobbying was done by doctors and advocacy groups. So we go through this whole host of gradual piling on of um, acts, amendments, and each one of them is a slight expansion over the other one of various rights and uh, re responsibilities of government and educational agencies. Americans Dis with Disabilities Act is very well known. It's having its 20th birthday this year. I mean. It seems incredible that 20 years ago we didn't have the ADA and, um, uh, you know, we, we had uh, the famous case of the uh, a mayor in a city in Connecticut saying, 
I'm not building the damn ramp. I'll just carry that little crippled child up the stairs that she wants to use the library. So it really took things like the ADA to add some robustness to making public places of public accommodation more accessible and available to people. Um, certainly an important Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA or IDEA, um, has been uh, very important and probably the most important act from, the, from my perspective in the area of special education. Um, with amendments, we have the interesting No Child Left Behind um, litigation or uh, legislation rather of 2001. Um, and then we have the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act of 2004, which sort of rode on the coattails of No Child Left Behind and added some new layers and dimensions to um, the I IDEA. We also have pending state and federal le legislation. And I'm not going to talk about the states now because it will just take too long. Know that it's better to be a person with autism in some states versus others. Um, even though we have federal law, uh, the delivery of services is so widely varied just within our own state from one city or town to another, but certainly in entire states um, you see a great disparity. Uh, so most of the litigation involves areas where people have fallen through the cracks you know, a right seems to be federally mandated and not delivered upon. So that's sort of the background and the context for why people take a look at federal legislation. Um, to me, the most important are the uh, IDEA, uh, you know, as improved in 2004, or the new IDEA. We can't stop calling it by the old acronym. It's too hard to come up with a new one. Um, we have the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, also sometimes shorthanded as Section 504. Okay, but you know the one that I think is most practical for daily life for many of our children on the spectrum is the IDEA. And um, one of the things the IDEA does is requires that each children should have an individualized educational program and that that child's education should be tailored to that person's specific needs. So you can't go in, oh, we've got autism, pick our garden, our garden variety autism program off the educational shelf, lock the child up in a room with all the other autistic children and put in the tape. Um, certainly has happened and is the urge in many areas. Um, educating children with autism is an extremely expensive proposition. And that's why, you know, it's in some ways unfair that the schools have to educate a disability, a, a medical condition. But um, that's where it happens. That's, that's where the best chances are. And so um, things like the IDEA have recognized that you've got to put into place a very specific program. Now, in order to determine what is specifically uh, and educationally appropriate for a child, you have to evaluate that child individually and presumably impartially, and there are rights that flow from that. School district may require that a child be evaluated. Parents may also require that. You may also bring in outside evaluations to be used as persuasive authority uh, to help uh, determine what is an educationally appropriate program. Um, we have to have input from a team. There has to be information from educators, specialists, and there should be parental or guardian participation, which is a whole new thing. Of It used to be people would go into the room and come out and tell you, here's what's going to happen with the rest of your child's life. And uh, the legislation and litigation caused a, a very significant change in allowing and, in fact, mandating parental or guardian participation in this process. It's very important. Um, Somebody's got to go home with the child at the end of the day and should not only be knowledgeable about what the goals and the aspects of the educational program are, about what they can do themselves. And it's been the source of a lot of litigation, which has helped define the contours of what is available. Um, when uh, one meets with an individual for an individualized educational program, um, 
Uh, it goes by a lot of different names. There's team meetings in Connecticut. It's typically called a PPT meeting. But the goal is to come up with this individualized educational program and um, come up with a document. The goal is actually consensus. This is not easily achieved. And sometimes consensus is only faux consensus, um, whereas you may have a room full of special educators and school officials and social workers. And then there's a parent sitting alone on the other side of the table. This is very daunting. Um, the law, to some extent, tries to offer the parent an ability to, to comment and participate and sign off on these things. But you know, in reality, your typical parent finds this overwhelming. And it's emotionally uh, a, a very hard experience. I was unable to represent my own child at um, IEPs, uh, in the IEP process for the first two years after his diagnosis. And I had been doing it for other people's children for um, probably 10, 12 years at that point. So case in point, it's just very difficult. And um, uh, it may be that sometimes educational programs, the, the deck is stacked a bit in their favor. And you may be given a program for your child that looks a lot like the last child who came in. and it may not be quite as individualized. And so that's what parents often talk and gripe about and worry about is that it's not truly individualized, but it may fit an economic or educational program that already is suitable for that school district. So those are some of the issues. Now the four basic tenets of the IDEA are to provide a free and appropriate public education for children with disabilities, and autism is specifically one of the enumerated disabilities, which is why you want that box checked on um, the forms. And it should emphasize special education and the child's unique needs. It also protects the rights of children with disabilities and parental rights. And having the parent as part of the process is essential, pa parent or guardian. And getting them involved early and often is a good thing. It's a very fatiguing condition. Parents are often burned out, emotional, um, not necessarily always on their best game. And so this can be an overwhelming process. Uh, IDEA is also meant to assist the states and local schools in the provision of special education and assess and assure the effectiveness of special education. These are sort of the lofty aspirational goals of the IDEA. Um, it was reauthorized in 2004. Um, and there's been a number of iterations of it. So um, you should know that when you speak of these things, as in most things, there's a layer of overlapping laws. We have all of the ones I showed in the long laundry list. Also, are, you know, many are still in place. Some of the laws are still good precedent, or there are later um, cases that come in that help modify it. But it's really a lot of layers to this this uh, special ed onion. So, but the fact that autism is specifically cited as a covered disability is very relevant for parents. Um, when the act was made a bit more robust and was tweaked in 2004 and a little bit beyond, um, it's increased the uh, uh, focus on the accountability of schools in successfully educating children with disabilities. Um, this ties, and I'll talk a little bit later about No Child Left Behind, but there's an increased um, emphasis on outcome measures and which strategies actually work, um, emphasis on measurable goals and outcome metrics. So mm -hmm. assessments are done, um, standardized testing has become part of the routine. Um, there are requirements of special education mm -hmm. teachers get this, be, spe be specialists in special education, and be highly qualified. Um, not always the case. Sometimes you wondered if someone had been taken out of the kitchen in a hairnet and you know, tossed into a special ed classroom just to sort of hold the peace. And that changed. So uh, uh, that's a wonderful requirement. And not only um, the teachers, but also paraprofessionals and other people who work with our students with um, autism and related disorders. So um, there are requirements that they not only be highly qualified and receive some education. Now, this may not always happen, but it offers parents 
and others an opportunity to explore that more fully with the school system if it doesn't. Um, but also the instructional strategies should be grounded in scientifically based research. Um, to be honest, when I first began to do this, some of the theories and the rationale for the proposed IEP or program that was being put forth for the child sounded like witchcraft. Um, it's, uh, I have heard it said, well, yes, there is this thing called Applied Behavior Analysis, ABA, but that's only for children who bark like seals and are, um, you know, ter terribly disabled. And you wouldn't want to limit your child to that kind of a lifestyle. You wouldn't want to do that to your child. And so we have this great, you know, mainstream classroom, and you really don't need that service. But service is expensive and time consuming and um, very difficult to find people who are qualified practitioners in it. I understand that, but. If that's what's in order, it should be provided. And so parents are not supposed to be talked out of um, the appropriate therapies. Um, under IDA, states, states actually have to enact, enact child find procedures. So they need to go look for these kids. Um, and there's an inter interesting um, act uh, that is uh, a subset of the IDEA requiring that, for example, homeless children be sought out in shelters and in other places, migrants, um, and be evaluated if need be to look for developmental disabilities or the hints of developmental disabilities, and if so, brought into the system and receive evaluations. Same things for children in private schools. Um, I should say that what forced me into the system was there was an insert in my paycheck one week that said, do you think your child may have a delay or a disability? I'd been in denial up until that point, but it was actually an outreach that was mandated by the state. And um, I read that, there was a toll-free number, and it was sort of a whistleblower line because it said, if you're the grandparent, friend, neighbor, anything to anybody who you think might have this, call this number and we'll get somebody out there. And um, it was at that point that I realized that um, it's time to get the head out of the sand and do something. They're really making outreach efforts. Um, so evaluation should occur. And of course, this is very difficult with some populations. If you've got migrant workers, you have people with significant language or educational backgrounds that just they don't understand what autism is. Um, cultural clashes occur. And so it's a very delicate balance at some point of trying to bring children into the system. Um, also of children being brought in and maybe resisted. We don't want to label your child. We would like to put this off. So um, the law wants these children to be brought in and evaluated to see if they do have a developmental disability and if so, what that might be and how it could be addressed. The goal is early intervention. Um, if a child is determined to have autism or an, a covered disability, uh, there's a requirement that they receive a free, appropriate public education, and FAPE or whatever you want to call it. Um, this is supposed to be a specially designed instructional program at no cost to the parents um, or the guardian. And this concept is terrific in, in actually implementing it. It can be very rough. Um, uh, school systems are sometimes under-equipped in some areas of the country. It's very difficult to find appropriate specialists. Um, there may not be a large population of children with not just autism, but whatever disability should present itself, and so it's difficult. But a program that deals with this individualized child, this individual child should be created. It should include all education-related services, such as transportation, uh, developmental assistance and support services not necessarily part of the regular curriculum. So that could be things like speech and again think of yourself as a parent who has no clue what any of this is. OTPT, um, the alphabet soup comes out and we really don't know what these are. If someone says do you want OT, you may think I don't know what that is, I don't want to sound stupid, I'll just decline. And um, if no one is there to explain this to a parent or they haven't done a lot of homework, services that can be very, very important may in fact not end up 
as part of this child's training or curriculum. Um, I should also point out that when they say a free, appropriate public, ed public education, it doesn't mean you get the Cadillac, the Rolls Royce of public educations here. And there's been a lot of, in, of uh, legislation and uh, litigation about this. I think the Rowley case is one of them. Um, it means appropriate doesn't mean the best or the one that's guaranteed to get the best possible outcome of all others for your individual child. It means an, an outcome that's legally comparable to the quality of education given to a typical student. So it, while it is supposed to be individualized, it is not going to be one that is meant to make your child superior to all others and receive something that a typical child would not normally receive, or a similarly situated child with your disability, such as autism. Um, that's a very fine line to dance. And that's an area where there's a lot of litigation and um, foment some discontent and unrest among parents and advocates for children with disabilities. Because what is appropriate? You know, if you are a parent, appropriate is the best you can possibly do for your child. If you're a school system, it's what do I have here that will fill that need and not err on the side of uh, excessive services. When the team meets, uh, the team is legally required to produce an IEP document, so that's an individualized educational program for your child. Um, and that's supposed to be a collaborative process. Um, attended many of these meetings where these are being drafted, and collaboration isn't necessarily always the word that comes to mind. But in, in the perfect world, it is supposed to be collaborative. And parents are supposed to have input. Um, uh, one thing parents and others who are advocating on behalf of children might realize is that they have the right to be able to request some of the documentation in advance. So there's a lot of testing of, your of a child with, with autism and special needs. Um, before you go to these meetings, from the parental perspective, legal perspective, it is good to not walk in blind. In a courtroom, we would never walk in without delivery of discovery documents beforehand to know what we were dealing with. It appears to be more often than not that families, or a single parent is often the case, show up at a PPT um, with no knowledge about what's going to be presented. And so um, one thing I would suggest that if it's co really collaborative, the uh, people representing the child, the parent, or the guardian would have access to the same information, testing, most recent scores, data, et cetera, that everybody else in the room does before you go in. Um, and and that, that I would say, in, um, of all the PPT meetings and IEP planning meetings I've been to, has been the single biggest failing, is to provide that information in advance so that others have a chance to absorb it maybe question it um, rather than receive it as a fait accompli. This is your child. Take them or leave them. This is what we think and we're the experts and so. Um, an IEP has to be in place at the beginning of the school year for every child with a disability or as soon thereafter as is practical. So when a child comes into the system, um, one of the first things you do is begin to plan the IEP meeting. Typically, um, they're held at the end of one school year to plan for the next year's meeting. You're trying to set very measurable goals. And, and IEP's kind of a, a daunting thing. Um, I happen to have one with me. And I just want to point out that this is the document that's supposed to be produced in the 45 minutes or so that is allowed for you to discuss your child's entire next year, which is often how frequently PTs or IEP planning meetings happen. And it's small type, has a lot of goals, lots of columns. Everyone else in the room understands the jargon and the language. And even at this state, I find myself with you know very strong glasses, fumbling wildly, and having them marked. It's very difficult to read. Um, Educators and those who are familiar with the IEP process are fluent in this. Your, your typical parent, guardian, advocate is, is not as fluent with it. Sometimes they are prepared before you even would walk into the door. So it's sort of like getting going in and negotiate a pre-written contract. So, um, and it sets forth. This is the contract. 
What this says is what your child is going to get or not get. Unless you're in a situation where you have a school system where they are more flexible and will say, you know, gee, we think we see something coming up not reflected in the IEP. Uh, we have the right to then say let's convene another IEP meeting and draft a new document or make a change or amendment or revision um, and it can sometimes even be done just without just with parental or guardian consent but this says what your child is going to be doing for the next presumably year and it sets forth very measurable goals in many areas um, in with regards to testing teaching language, speech, every single area of development. So the reality of this is producing something satisfying and holistic and appropriate in the typical 45 minute meeting is very slim. So uh, my suggestion is to have the documentation in advance, to have reviewed it closely, these forms are available online and you can see what you know you're going to be looking at what benchmarks might be set for your child you can request these and then um, have your own set of goals in mind too so the key to an effective IEP meaning for a parent guardian and from the parental perspective at least is to go in well prepared and with a set of succinct questions Try to remain as unemotional as humanly possible. It's sometimes difficult. Um, one catches more flies by being a reasonable and rational person. It's better to, um, to walk away and reconvene than get into a, an altercation, frankly, in my experience. But it's a very highly charged and emotional issue, so I just mentioned that. Um, sometimes things break down and people either can't agree or won't agree or you hit some impasse or there's a not a strict implementation of what has been agreed upon and parents guardians um, and sometimes school districts do have the right to bring things to a due process hearing and that is a um, it's what it sounds like it's it's a, a administrative hearing where a skilled trained hearing officer hopefully would be reviewing the complaints and the rebuttals from both sides and trying to figure out where the problems lay. Is there an overreaching on the part of one party, underperformance on the part of another, where is the IEP, IEP falling short, et cetera. So there, there are mechanisms built within the IDEA to allow, and other um, laws, to allow for due process hearings. And then, again, people can always go to court, too. There's um, quite a body of uh, certainly federal legislation in, and state um, regarding disability education. One of the things that's mandated in the IDEA is the least restrictive environment. And this is something that, you know, um, seems like it makes sense now, but for people who have been around for more than 20 years, we remember the days of the training schools and the special school and where a child might have been taken away and um, put in a very restrictive environment because unmanageable refrigerator mother has caused the situation. Um, I have no doubt that um, 40 years ago my child would be nonverbal, uh, probably in a training school being visited on Saturdays if we still remembered him, and um, would be uh, you know, not the speaking, happy, playing, going to camp kid that we have. So talking about least restrictive environment, I can't emphasize enough. It requires that children with disabilities should be educated in the least restrictive environment to meet their individual needs and goals. Doesn't mean child has to be fully mainstreamed, and mainstreaming is, is the goal, but it can be done with variations and permutations of that. So there may be pullouts from a regular classroom for speech and OT. Um, there are some cases that hold that there's certain cases in children and types of disabilities where that's not possible. So some, some laws have held that, uh, or some cases have held that you can have a special autism unit within a school. But what we don't want is the old days of segregation. Remember, this started with Brown v. Board of Education. And so the idea of pulling our child, children away and putting them in a segregated area for a very special and different 
type of education is not the goal. We want them to be inclusive. Um, as I said, there have been cases that have held the placement in special and separate autism unit within a school can meet the least restrictive, restrictive environment and not deprive a student of, uh, of a FAPE. Um, however, even then, there would be times when the children should be brought together, and that's in most of the cases. Things like lunch, things, you know, common areas that all children do, um, still meant to be brought together um, when possible and when not a danger to themselves or others. And that, that, of course, standard varies. We don't want children who are engaging in self-injurious behavior or hurting others, and yet modeling with typical peers may in fact be the best way to help reduce that kind of behavior. So it's a fine line. One that gets fought out fairly frequently. And I know that one quite well myself. Um, many parents have a knee-jerk reaction and say, I have to find the best private school for my child. This public school is not going to work. Well, um, no. A public school is not required to pay for private education unless they can't do it. You know, if they can't effectively educate your child, um, then private education uh, may in fact be in order and you may be entitled to it. In many or most cases, it takes going to a due process hearing to be able to establish that burden of proof, that there's been a failure on the part of the school system. Um, I met with a parent last week who said, I don't want to send my child in and have them fail for a year and regress and feel just awful about themselves before they can go to the place that we know they need to go. Unfortunately, or realistically, the law says the schools are supposed to be making a good faith effort to do this, and many in most cases they are. If it doesn't work, then you move to that step. And there are a number of special schools for children with autism um, and developmental disorders and lots of other disabilities. But that's thought to be the, res the last resort. So that's a place where you go because it isn't the least restrictive environment. It is, in fact, segregating your child to a large extent with children with a similar disability and not mainstreaming them. So, um, and they're very expensive. It, you know, expense can't be forgotten as part of this. To so take a child out of a school system, remember transportation is included in this, possibly in aid, so there may be not only, you know, the little van comes in the morning and takes your child away to a remote school, but there'll be an aide on that bus to help your child. Um, the private school tuition must be borne by the school district. Uh, there's a lot of things in, encompassed in this that are very expensive. And actually, that often acts as an incentive for schools to broaden their range of services. At least that's what I've found recently, is that schools are becoming more inclusive and more interested in expanding services. Uh, maybe partly because of the economic disincentive of, of placing kids out in, in a private setting. Um, one of the things that uh, in, exists is the early intervention services. And I think I mentioned my pay stub. That was when, um, you know, I had a, I think, 15-month-old who began to speak in a German accent one day and then stopped the next. And um, I wasn't quite sure that was, but everybody said, oh, don't worry, it's just a phase. Um, the pay stub said, if you think your kid has a developmental disability and seems to be doing something unusual and it's not on track, you can call, your mother can call, your neighbor can call. And so federal grants are given to states for the impl implementation of these early intervention programs. And what they're trying to do is capture kids early on and bring them into the system. Some of these things may be, again, just a phase, a quirk. We want to make sure. It may be something more serious, and that's where some preliminary diagnosis and treatment can be done. The services should be customized, and they, can be form and they should be formalized with an individual family services plan, and there should be no cost to the family. In this state, it's called birth to three. In, there's a, a different name in almost every state, but it's meant to bring young children into the system early enough so that if it's something that can be jump-started with some quick therapy, fine. If it's something that points to a longer term problem, we begin to document that and set that up so that when the child becomes three, they can enter the regular school system. My child was 
three years and four hours before he went into the regular school system. Um, so it's, it's fairly robust. It was all, all ready to go. And it does allow for services that are related directly to autism. Um, ABA, speech, language, OT, PT, the whole array of, of uh, acronyms. Another thing children with autism are entitled to and children with other disabilities is an extended school year, so the ESY um, or SE. If a student requires, I guess that's a typo, an extended school year, so that's beyond the traditional number of days, which is typically around 180, 185 or so, to accomplish the FAPE, then you get the extended school year, or should get the extended school year. Often it won't be offered, but it should be requested. Um, it's no longer necessary to prove that a child would significantly regress in order to um, get an extended school year, although that is very often given as a reason for denying an extended school year. Um, but you do have to establish what the level of impairment is, the, the length of the gap. Some children may in fact require extended school year just through short holiday breaks. It really depends. And, you know, schools have varying uh, degrees of how much they're willing to go along with. Um, but a lot of it has to do with uh, whether or not your child is going to continue to progress, stay the same, may regress, uh, or whether that child is just dependent upon those daily services. And if an extended school year is given, it can include the whole array of things that the child would get during the school year, or it could be profoundly different. It could be something like going to camp with an aide to have more additional mainstreaming, or it could be intensive speech, OT, behavioral therapy, whatever, uh, ABA, et cetera. Um, okay, so another act, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, this is a little, I'm kind of going backwards a little bit because um, with this is what we used before we had um, a lot of other things in our arsenal. Um, this is often called a Section 504 or just 504. And it was really legislation designed to end discrimination against individuals with disabilities. And so it was an attempt to improve services and education in a world where there was very little service or education specifically for people with disabilities. One of the more robust bits of it was that it prohibits discrimination not only by the U.S. government and government contractors and those receiving federal funds, but if you're getting federal grants or aid, aid you're covered under Section 504. Well, but for the exception of a minuscule number of schools and school systems and educational institutions in the country, almost everybody gets some form of federal aid. And so therefore, Section 504 would apply to these places. And it was what we really hung our hat on before we had a lot of other, you know, more evolved litigation and robust legislation. Americans with Disabilities Act, as I said, is only 20 years old. And it was based in a large part on Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. Um, it took it a step further, and it really addressed the rights of individuals with disabilities in many, many areas of life, in employment, um, in education, in places of public accommodation, and other activities. The public accommodation portion of that's important because public accommodation is pretty much if there's a private business someone wants to go to and there's an impediment to getting into there um, or for preventing their use of it, accommodation has to be made under fairly broad um, guidelines. So um, with the beginning of the ADA, one began to see, for example, ramps being built into architecture. So architectural barriers had to come down. You know, and in the early days of disability um, litigation, people would say things like, well, if there's no legs, fine, I'll, I'll deal with that. You know, we'll, we'll cover that. But these hidden disabilities, I don't, just tell the child to fly straight and behave and act right. And so it took much longer for um, the world to evolve from the actual visual disability that could be easily verified by any lay person to the ones that were much more subtle and nuanced. Um, in fact, many parents with children with autism, even if their child is perfectly verbal, will use sign because that sends a signal to the world that I've got this special child. Stay away. Don't come up and tell me to beat him. Um, 
he's acting out because he has autism, not because he's a bad child. And so it just is code for leave us alone. Um, sad to still be using things like that, but um, I do it all the time. Um, so the ADA uh, addressed both the public and the private sector, and so it really extended the provisions of um, and protections of 504. 43 million Americans with disabilities had very little recourse against discrimination. There were some laws in the books, you know, 504, et cetera, saying you can't do it, but there weren't a lot of teeth in it. You know, there weren't a, a lot of damages, there weren't attorney's fees available, so there wasn't that much litigation. The ABA was much more robust, uh, much more widely promoted and anticipated and hailed, and it prohibited discrimination based on documented disability, and so there is a requirement that you have certain types and natures of disabilities, and it requires reasonable accommodations, so not everything. It has to be something that is feasible um, in the workplace and other settings, and that's pretty broad. Um, it covers individuals with autism, that's what makes it important uh, for this lecture. Um, employers can't discriminate against people with disabilities. Now, you have to be otherwise qualified under the ADA. So, um, you know, a person with a third grade education couldn't say, well, you know, I really wanted to go to Yale Medical School and that's my goal under the ADA. You know, you have to be otherwise qualified. So you have to have met certain um, benchmarks, but it certainly does help a child who or an individual who has a disability who does meet the criteria from being overtly discriminated against. Public services such as transportation and government ent entities may not discriminate and must accommodate. No one ever heard of a kneeling bus 20 years ago. I mean, these are, these are new things. Um, public accommodations owned by a private entity can't discriminate or have architectural barriers. If you think about just that alone, the, what that did for the architecture and building industry, um, you see a lot of really ugly ramps out there now that were retrofitted, um, but it's important, it opened doors, it literally, for doorways were widened, um, lots of things happened. And telecommunications have to be accessible. All segment of our population, many, many of our children are not verbal, and so it allows for you know, people to use adaptive technology and brought that much more into the prominence in, in schools and in the workplace. So ADA isn't really an education act in terms of it is a special ed thing, but it does allow, uh, it does bring um, education within it and it allows for man monetary damages. So we do see more litigation since the ABA has come into place. Um, and there's certain parameters for being covered by, by it. And it also allowed professionals with disabilities to enter the workplace. Wonderful models, maybe, for children who have a disability themselves and others. Um, the last one I'm going to mention is No Child Left Behind. Um, that was, uh, I think it was 1980 or 81, no, no 90 or 91. Um, but it uh, required all public schools to bring every child up to state standards in reading and math within specified time frames based on testing. It is very testing oriented. Um, it is daunting to the parents of children with disabilities. Um, a double-edged sword here. Uh, the goal was to improve the academic achievement of the, dis of the disadvantaged, but it did not, it, it counts our children's accomplishments or lack thereof on standardized testing in whether or not a school has failed. So this is something that um, is of great importance to schools. Many schools teach to the, the annual test. Um, there's a fear that children will, with disabilities might be segregated into an already failing school because that can be sacrificed. And if our kids aren't going to accomplish at the same rate as other children, they um, might just be put in there and allowed to fail. So people have to be vigilant about that. Okay, so there's other legislation. Um, the Combating Appro Autism Appropriations Act did appropriate $184 million um, as part of the uh, 2009 Omnibus Appropriations Act. Uh, that um, is not much money, really, when you think of $184 million for a country 
um, is not a lot. It was a, I like to think of it as the first drop in that bucket. It's maybe the Brown versus Board of Education beginning to open some doors. There's some pending things too, and um, the Autism Treatment Acceleration Act of 2009, although we're in 2010 now, it proposes comprehensive autism legislation, services for adults, which is an ever-growing issue. I mean, nobody ever thinks about adults in these things, but um, what happens then? Another legal issue you know, we'll have to face is an increasing number of people with autism being arrested and becoming part of the um, judicial system, the, you know, the prison population, et cetera. Mandatory inclusion of diagnosis and treatment for autism by insurance. Insurance has been probably the single largest impediment for families trying to get services for their children. Um, if they're not able to get everything from a school, they couldn't also get it from on their own. Um, there's also some other things pending, like the ABLE Accounts Act of 2009. And very simplistically, that would maybe allow people to put aside some money um, in a tax-protected area that wouldn't automatically child prevent a child from receiving some services for which they otherwise might be deemed too rich. So uh, a parent could save for the child's future, but not in doing so endanger their ability to get into that group home or sheltered workshop or you know, receive enti uh, entitlements. Then there's another one called the Preventing Harmful Restraint and Seclusion in Schools Act. Sometimes autis autistic children and other children um, act out in school and there's been obviously some horrific stories about restraints and inappropriate seclusion. Um, I've seen some of this, it's truly horrifying. Um, and so this is meant to set federal standards that would help to legislate that. Um, one thing that's pending is the Global Autism Assistance Act. And if you want to talk about a drop in the bucket, now we're talking about $10 million over three years to help the world. And, um, but it's a start. I mean, this is something that wouldn't have occurred to anyone 20 years ago, just the way, you know, what I'm talking about is recent legislation wouldn't have occurred to anyone. Um, this is to get the world in developing countries somewhere up to the standards and thinking about the types of educational opportunities that we offer here and services. And maybe a teach the teachers and information sharing program. So, um, I'm going to close with just a little bit about international legal perspectives because, as you can imagine, um, we're very, very fortunate in this country to sort of be at the vanguard of this, um, and it's a sliding scale all over the world. Um, I'd have to say that disabilities in general, uh, and certainly autism, because it's not a visible disability, is treated uh, quite differently. Even if there are laws on the books in certain countries, protecting the rights of individuals with disabilities. Autism is one of, I'd say, the, the, the last ones to be seen. It's often seen as bad behavior or a curse upon a family, or in, you know, in, since it's incurable, why bother? Um, certainly the EU, um, many of the countries in the EU have very, in Europe, have very sophisticated programs in place, many based on or in collaboration with American programs. Um, I just picked two countries that happen to be the two most populous in the world and where I've spent a lot of time with my child, and it's been interesting to see. Um, in India, the national government has sponsored health insurance for people with autism. Um, you know, we just did that. They did that a long time ago, actually. They have had tax deductions available for families with children with autism. The reality, of course, is that the people, many of the people of India live so far below the poverty line that these are really things that in order to a, a very small percentage of the population. They did ratify the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, everything is um, done by boards in India. The Central Board of Secondary Education allows up to three hours of extra time on exams for students with autism. So these are on things like, you know, our version of maybe the SATs or something like that. Um, we might not recognize that as exactly the, dis the accommodation that we would want for such a thing, but this is a step. Um, the avail in reality, the available of autism education and therapy is very, very limited. I've um, been to schools for children with autism in India. They're usually the children of the elite of the embassy community. Um, in rural India, it's, it's unheard of. The children are typically raised at home and uneducated. Um, and then in China, 
And China's actually done an interesting kind of long-term study. They have nine-year compulsory education for all children, and they encourage, rather than mandate, that schools include children with disabilities. So um, the encouragement isn't necessarily the strongest in the world. Um, it might happen, although teachers are rewarded based on how well people do on tests and how what kind of progress they make through their schools. And if children with disabilities and autism are not really going to progress at the same rate, they may not, they may fall through the cracks. There's an estimate of about 2 million individuals with autism and at least 80% of them not being diagnosed in China. I would suspect the number is actually much higher and um, there's not currently a, a real efficient way of trying to evaluate or uh, uh, tighten that number. It was recently regarded as a real illness. Up until then, it had been thought of as either a behavioral problem or comparable with cerebral palsy mental illness and not segregated out on its own or given special thought. There is no special curriculum for autism in most places. Again, the schools for children with autism in China tend to be largely populated by the ruling elite and by um, foreigners doing business in that country, embassies, etc. So that's about the really fast and dirty version of the law regarding special education, autism, and related disorders. Uh, left out a lot more than I've said, obviously, but I'm certainly happy to answer any questions or you know, whatever you would like to ask. Yes? Yes, that's. Very well. Yeah, very yes. Well. And <laughs> sure. So they don't see that it, it affects their educational program. Sure. And let me repeat the question is just um, what about schools where they draw a distinction between um, medically diagnosed autism and educationally diagnosed or not recognized autism? Um, it's interesting. Uh, my theory has always been, and the one that I think has been most successful. Um, one I would urge parents who are able or guardians who are able to do so is to certainly never walk into that first meeting with the team, the IEP team, without medical documentation. Um, sometimes schools will, or, you know, will do exactly the right thing and, and get an independent medical evaluation, but this distinction between a doctor saying the child has autism and the school saying, well, he made eye contact and knows his numbers, um, in my opinion, and thankfully in the opinion of the law most times, is the doctor wins. Um, it is a medical diagnosis. It is not a classroom diagnosis. Certainly classroom observation is important, but in order to establish the legal foundation for eligibility for services, if um, a uh, reputable physician, therapist, psychologist, etc., someone who's qualified to make such a diagnosis has done so, the school may in fact be worried that someone has gone out and gotten a hired gun and is soliciting some type of a diagnosis for whatever purposes and may want to have another evaluation done. Um, even in those cases I have seen the school still say, well, but he counts perfectly well, he can talk. No, if the child has autism, I think that um, the hand shakes when you get to that box on the IEP form, but that box should be checked because that is the one that opens the door to services for the child. So um, I know that that is a practice that occurs sometimes. It's regrettable 
Um, that is one where I think parents would do well. There's one instance where maybe the internet is a, a good place for getting information, it's a great place for charlatans, but also a good place to walk in with a couple of pages printed out from the IDEA. And there's some wonderful websites that are truthful and realistic and can just say, you know, no, when you have a medical diagnosis um, and you meet the following criteria, the school must capitulate. So that's one where, frankly, if it went on long enough, that would be worthy of due process. And that's the legal yeah, right. Um, Can you think of a good time where a school failed this child test? Constantly voted not to file it. Yes, I, and the question is what about the flip side? And absolutely. Um, as an advocate, that's even more maddening to me is um, because if I'm involved, it's usually because the parent has asked me to be, it's always because the parent has asked me to be involved in the case. I only do pro bono work on behalf of parents and children. And so I'm there as their advocate, but as soon as somebody says something like, well, we want to provide applied behavior analysis, well, my neighbor told me that that's how they train the SEALs at SeaWorld, and I don't, I think that sounds cruel and unusual. I don't want that. And sometimes you see the frustration in the face of educators who actually do want to reach out for a child and try to help them. And it, 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 um, that's even more maddening in a way because I typically you can go to a due process and win in the other instance where you have reputable doctors saying, you know, but a parent is entitled to do what they want. They may, in fact, take their child out and homeschool that child, do a lot of other things to be evasive. They don't want the label. And, you know, uh, part of what being a good advocate is, I think, don't fear the label. It's, um, it can be your friend and can work affirmatively with you. Um, no one really reads these IEPs outside of a very small group, so the neighbors don't have to know if you don't want them to know. They may guess, you know, because of behavior and other things, but, um, but yes, it's true that um, sometimes schools will reach out and sometimes it's cultural, um, sometimes it's just an educational thing or a mistrust of the system, mind control, whatever it is. But yes, uh, in, in some instances, parents refuse very legitimate and well-intentioned services. It's very frustrating. Um, I don't know how to deal with that one, frankly, very well. Right. Um, and that certainly the law talks about generalizing um, in different settings among the school and the community. Um, and a lot of um, the children and teenagers and children have more challenging behaviors. Right. Um, parents are really exhausted um, uh, trying to get home based services in terms of schools being financially responsible, insurance, entanglements. Um, right. Uh, the question is, what about home-based services or, or even services outside of the school setting? And um, yes, the law does say that we want children to be able to generalize these skills. So it may be that you know, very often an, a child with autism is rewarded for being the quiet one who sits in the corner. That's not good therapy for that child, probably, but um, they're seen as the model student. This is our best autistic student in the school because he or she doesn't say anything and um, fills out the papers like they're supposed to. A child may turn into a, a maniac at home and may have, without the structure of the school, may completely lose it and, um, and need significant intervention and often may be doing self-injurious behavior um, or engaging in um, wandering, you know, lots of things. Um, it is certainly possible um, 
schools, let me put it this way, schools should uh, address generalization outside of the classroom. Um, a good IEP will look forward to that. Remember, if it's not in the IEP, you're unlikely to get it. So you have to walk in the door anticipating that. It's always possible to reconvene an IEP too, and so a uh, meeting. And so um, if something evolves, you can refine this later on, but um, that should be built into the IEP. You're not going to just spontaneously say, oh, let's come to the house Tuesday night, hide behind the curtains, and watch while Jimmy you know, swings from the chandeliers. Um, but, but they will if it's in the IEP, and you have to get them to agree to that. That sometimes takes you know, anywhere from just a subtle suggestion. Sometimes um, I suggest, for example, that parents videotape this kind of conduct because the school will be dumbfounded. They're fine. They're terrific in school. Nicest little kid we have. And then you show a videotape of a Tasmanian devil outside the classroom, and they really legitimately can't believe that's the same child. So I find that by giving the school as much evidence, again, um, in some areas that might be seen as a bit antagonistic, and I think it's important to maintain as good a relationship and as close a collaborative relationship with the school system as is possible. So if it's presented as, um, I know this is hard to believe based on the reports that are coming home about my child, but take a look. This is what every night is, and there's a, a abuse of our pet, and there's you know bite marks everywhere, and here's some op hospitalization reports for you know everyone's been eaten alive at home. Um, that may help, in fact, to get services, particularly as you accumulate that. And if that service if that's conduct that should begin, for example, after an IEP is in place, um, it's certainly very, very possible and a right to say, you know, we have something new. We have to deal with this. It's out of school. We're having another IE another meeting. We're going to draft uh, revisions to the IEP to address this conduct. There's still school districts that say that's not their ability. That's not why it's in the system. And refer parents to this state and that Right, and there's still school districts that will say that it, the question is whether or not, you know, what do you do if the school district says no? Um, some school districts still say they don't do extended school years. Yeah. They don't do transportation. They don't do, you name it, um, swimming lessons. They, you know, whatever it is that you might feel. Um, and it's the job of the advocate to try to educate the school system in the nicest possible way at first about um, their rights and obligations. And um, I think that getting documentation is, is the way to really do it. Um, there's almost nothing that hasn't been denied as something that, if it's something that someone has received somewhere else, it, it hasn't, it's also been denied in a million other places. So I really think that that's part of the ongoing and very fatiguing advocacy that takes place on the part of whoever is in charge of that child's care or most invested in it, whether it's a, you know, an advocate, a lawyer, a parent, a guardian, whatever. Uh, I think what's going to bring it to light is the awareness that still hasn't happened in adult mental health outcomes. You because betcha. Because it's not the Department of Ed still, and it's still it's not their problem, but it's the government's problem. It's the adult outcomes showing that even if the child today doesn't get an academic education, Yes, Ad adulthood is the scary beyond. And, and you know, it's an interesting, I um, just was in Los Angeles and I received a lot of materials from the Los Angeles Police Department, which has a very robust program for educating police officers about individuals with autism. And um, my friend who's a police commissioner in LA and that has been his particular um, area of interest. And so, um, uh, just now, police departments and other places are beginning to be trained because you are going to see what happens. The school door closes, and are we driving? Are we, you know what? Are, what are we doing? We're allowed to drink. We're you know all sorts of things happen, and so um, I do think that as our population ages and the you know we have this ever-growing mass that's coming forward, um, we are going to see increased emphasis on earlier interventions in what will later become 
adult bad behaviors. One thing I suggest to parents who have a child on the spectrum who may be inclined to be a bit of a, a wild child, and I speak from personal experiences, to go to the local police station and firehouse and EMTs once a year with a picture and say, here, here's my child, if seen alone, if picked up for shoplifting, big hobby, um, or um, doing anything else like that, you know, n this is a child with autism. Um, there are stickers you can get for your house uh, that say occupant with autism. Um, if it catches fire, uh, may not respond to verbal commands, and look in the closets, go to the base, you know. So um, I think there's clues that we can give the outside world too that helps them to, to bring it in. Um, so you don't want, you know, you don't want to put your, your person in a t-shirt that says, I have autism and put this, you know, label for the world to see, but there has to be some recognition that um, people, uh, you know, individuals with autism are going to need lifetime services. Um, I mean, think about the geriatric implications. You know, there's very few um, documented geriatric cases and there's not much case law about it, but it is coming and it's going to be big and I don't know that we're necessarily prepared for that. So that's law that will be coming up. Okay, thank you.